All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Multimodality Imaging Conference today. My name is Maad al Malah. I'm the head of cardiac PET at the Houston Methodist, and today is an interesting session. We're going to be discussing stress SPECT and PET methodology and case studies. We will be going over some basic principles of stress testing and nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging with SPECT and PET. And then we will go over through some interesting cases to illustrate how these modalities work in real life. Uh, you can always join us by web by sending questions by going to Paul EV and enter Debakey and then respond to the activity or you can text Debakey to 37607 and text in your message. So to start in with the methodology of stress testing and nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging, we're going to have a talk by Dr. Faisal Nabi, who is a associate professor in our department and uh, multimodality imager. And Dr. Nabi is going to introduce us to the concepts behind nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging. Dr. Nabi? Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Omala. Uh, it's my honor today to be, be able to present to you all some basic methodology of nuclear imaging. So kind of a broad outline, we, we have a lot of different things to touch on. We'll be discussing some myocardial perfusion imaging principles, how we do stress protocols, different radio tracers that are involved, what are imaging protocols involved, a little bit about image interpretation, a lot of this Dr. Pornazi will be going over with us, and then some discussion on diagnostic accuracy and prognostic value of um, nuclear imaging. So let's just begin. Uh, everybody knows when ischemia takes place, there is a series of events that occur. These include first perfusion imaging, followed by diastolic dysfunction, followed by systolic dysfunction. And then towards the end, really, is when you start developing EKG changes. And lastly, the patient will develop angina. Now, as this ischemic cascade develops, it's important for us to have imaging, because imaging is really what's going to be the tool that is used to identify the ischemia. And you can see here nuclear-based imaging techniques identify perfusion abnormalities, which, are one, which is really the first step of the ischemic cascade. So if we look at a functional imaging test, it's really composed of two parts. You have a stressor that needs to be administered, followed by some method to, again, identify the ischemia or the flow discrepancy. And for today's talk, of course, we're going to be talking about nuclear techniques. And this is what, you know, and th this is really what makes up a, a functional imaging test. So what kind of stressors do we uh, use for our patients? Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about exercise. We're going to be talking about pharmacological stress. We'll be talking about why we actually need to perform uh, stress. Then we need the method to identify ischemia. Here, of course, we're using nuclear imaging, and for that we need specific radio tracers that are specific both for both SPECT and PET. For SPECT radio tracers, we'll going, be going over uh, technetium-based agents and thallium, and for, of course, the uh, PET radio tracers, which are rubidium and ammonium. And then, of course, once you are able to image uh, uh, the patient and create an image, you know, and we're gonna, I'll be able to show you how these tests can very, then help you to identify coronary artery disease, quantify the degree of abnormality, and then help you to estimate prognosis and ho hopefully help you with decision making. So let's uh, begin. So why is it important to exercise? And, and this is really data from Lance School, which kind of hopefully will help you to understand this better. Really, you can see here that at resting conditions without stress, that really coronary flow does not start decreasing until the lesion is ex very severe, maybe 90% or greater. However, if you look at when you perform stress imaging and you have maximal flow, the, uh, you, you can see the curve starts to curve around at least a 50-60% lesion. So you start seeing decrease in flow 
at, at a much earlier um, uh, stenosis severity. And this is really why we need to perform stress imaging. It's, it's the ability to be able to visualize a difference um, in perfusion between the stress state and the resting state. So this is kind of uh, goes over how this would work. You can imagine if you're at rest here, you know, even despite there's a snowsis here on this right side, you know, that flow is going to be performed. You're going to have an equal amount of radio tracer that's deposited in the side that has the obstruction versus the side that does not have the obstruction, and you'll have, see a homogeneous perfusion picture. Whereas if you imagine a patient who's under, uh, if you stress this patient, all of a sudden that stenosis now at stress becomes functionally significant. You have a pressure drop off across that stenosis, flow decreases across that stenosis. You have decreased radio tracer that's deposited in the territory that's served by that stenosis. Whereas on the other side, you have increased flow and increased radio tracer distribution, and you're now able to, on your perfusion images, very nicely be able to see a difference between an, a, an area that's served by a stenotic artery and an area that's served by a normal artery. Now, an important point I'll emphasize here and later as well, SPECT detects relative flow, uh, bl blood flow differences, whereas with PET, you can also detect absolute blood flow differences. So now that we understand how to exercise, one of the ways we exercise, our preferred mode of exercise, is treadmill testing. Now, um, why treadmill testing? Well, many reasons. It, you, you can get a lot of very valuable information, including a patient's symptoms. Really, that's when a lot of patients complain of symptoms. They can have heart rate issues. You can, you can monitor their blood pressure. You can look at their EKG changes, and you can look for arrhythmias. And another, another very important prognostic factor is you can look at the amount of duration of exercise, which is their functional capacity. And these are two studies uh, done um, much earlier, which shows us the importance of exercise over just clinical data. And this first study, you can see if you have a negative EKG or, uh, or a patient who can exercise into late stages uh, of the treadmill, tre treadmill test, this is a low risk group with low um, uh, with a very good prognosis. Whereas if you have a positive EKG or if you're not able to exercise uh, 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 into uh, past stage three, these patients consider high risk and have a poor survival. In another large cohort, you can see that based on the amount of exercise capacity a patient has, you can very nicely discriminate, uh, uh, differentiate uh, their risk of death based on simply their exercise capacity. Now, one thing I will mention for when you do uh, an exercise treadmill test, it's very important to be, get the patient to uh, their 85% uh, of their maximum predicted heart rate. This is a study showing you very nicely that if you do not, and in this particular case, only get them to 70% peak heart rate, you can see you will underdiagnose ischemia by uh, perfusion imaging. EKG may very well be normal, and the patient may not even have symptoms. Now, you should know contraindications to treadmill testing. Obviously, these are a lot of common thing, sense things. You know, if you're having an acute myocardial infarction, not a good idea to get somebody on the treadmill. If they're having ongoing unstable angina, if they have uncontrolled arrhythmias, if they're in decompensated heart failure, if they have very, very elevated blood pressures. So these are, you know, uh, considered contraindications for uh, treadmill testing. So in those patients who you may not be able to exercise uh, because of the uh, contraindications I mentioned, or maybe their EKG is uninterpretable because, because of baseline STT changes, uh, they may be um, in an arrhythmia or they may be on anti-ischemic medicines, these are patients then we would consider for pharmacological testing. And these are two different types here. We've got the vasodilators, of which the vast majority of the time we are using regadenosin. And then you have uh, the inotropic, chronotropic agents, which is dibutamine, again, very rarely used nowadays.
So the agent that we really are using vast majority of the time to vasodilator stress our patients is regadenosin. This is an agent that works at the A, it's specific to the A2A receptor, which is responsible for coronary vasodilation. And therefore, you do not get a lot of the other uh, side effects of, um, uh, 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 you know, of the other um, um, adenosine receptors, which include bradycardia and bronchospasm. You can see here the common side effects when the patient uh, uh, is de delivered this medicines are common, so your patients will complain of some symptoms. That is normal. This is a drug that in general has a very quick onset of action. And in fact, you know, once you have uh, injected the patient, you give a five mi um, a milliliter saline bolus, and within 30 seconds, you're uh, ready to inject your radi radio pharmaceutical. And the drug in general will last within your system for about 30 minutes. In general, these drugs are very well tolerated, but there are some contraindications that we have to be aware of, and those are simply, uh, you know, effects on other adenosine receptors. So if your patient is actively having bronchospastic disease, you know, even though this is selective to the A2A receptors, you know, you would proceed with caution. And if, uh, sim similarly, if they have advanced degrees of AV block, um, you know, these would probably not be good candidates for this test. And of course, if your patient is very, uh, is already hypotensive, these are, tend to be vasodilatory agents and will lower your blood pressure further. Um, it's important to know then, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that um, there are situations where you may need to reverse uh, the regadenosin drug. We do have an agent called aminophilin, and this is often delivered if your patient develops profound hypertension or if they develop complete heart block, wheezing symptoms, or, or you see marked um, uh, EKG changes with chest pain. A common question we frequently get is, what about caffeine? Um, as you know, caffeine is a methylxanthine. It, it competes with um, the um, adenosine, regadenosine, dipyridomol, all, the, uh, all these different agents for the adenosine receptor. And what's important to note is that this was a nice study that kind of answered that question. You know, if you took a look at, this was a double blind randomized study. So these were patients who first had their study done with regadenosin, and then they were given either doses of 200 milligrams of caffeine or 400 milligrams of caffeine. And what you can see is here very nicely is once you receive caffeine, you can see a marked difference in the number of reversible defects that you're able to detect. So it will definitely decrease the size of the ischemic defect. Now caffeine uh, in general has a half-life of uh, five hours. So if you look for two and a half standard deviations, you're looking at about 12 hours is what we recommend our patients to hold the, um, uh, any caffeinated products. Uh, there are tables out there telling you how much caffeine is in different products. You know, a, 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 co a cola product will have anywhere from 50 to 60 milligrams, whereas your coffees can have, in general, almost 200 to 300 milligrams of caffeine. So here is a study that shows you um, the effects of caffeine uh, very nicely. This was a patient who had regadenosin plus placebo, and you can see a perfusion abnormality here at the apex, uh, a mild uh, perfusion abnormality. This was then repeated with caffeine, and you can see that you know you may be in, you may have called this study normal because now it's a very it's an even milder perfusion abnormality. Uh, another very important uh, thing to talk about is oftentimes, you know, what the effect of anti-ischemic therapy does for our patients. Obviously, because these are anti-ischemic drugs, they will mask ischemia and therefore decrease the sensitive VR test or at least decrease the amount of perfusion abnormality we're seeing. This is a study showing you how, you know, in each of the different coronary territories, studies have very nicely shown that with having antianginals on board will decrease your ability to pick up perfusion abnormalities. So it's important here to know that if you're first, if you're going to be making the first diagnosis of CAD, it's very important to hold any anti-ischemic therapy because you really want to be able to um, uh, correctly make the diagnosis. Whereas if they are already known CAD and on treatment, well then you may just want to assess uh, how much ischemia they have on baseline therapy. So, you know, when it comes down to uh, moving on now, um, 
you know, when it comes down to imaging the heart uh, with radio tracers, you know, we give a radio tracer, it's extracted by the uh, myocardium in, in relationship to blood flow. Uh, these photons then em are emitted uh, from the myocardium um, and are captured by uh, the electronic equipment and converted into a digital image. We have two radio tracers for SPECT. These are thallium-based agents and technetium-based agents. A lot of tables out there I recommend to review, very ripe for questions on the nuclear boards. You know, but in general, if I can summarize some things, thallium is a lower energy um, 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 a radio tracer. It has a, it's a 74 keV energy, whereas technetium-based agents are 140 keV. This predisposes technetium-based agents to having much higher image quality um, because of their higher energies. Uh, thallium has a very long half-life of 73 hours, and therefore we give a much lower dose. But this then does all still translates into a higher radiation exposure than the technetium-based agents. Uh, thallium has the property of redistribution, becomes important for viability imaging. That property is not seen with the technetium-based agents. Thallium is eliminated through the um, um, genitor urinary tract, and you can often see images where the kidney and the bladder light up, whereas the uh, technetium-based agents are eliminated through the hepatobiliary system. When do you use technetium over thallium? You know, nowadays most people are using technetium because of its better radiation exposure, less attenuation artifacts, much image, higher image quality and count statistics. What about PET radio tracers? You know, PET works on a different principle. These are five 11 keV um, uh, photons that get annihilated and travel in opposite directions from each other. This is a very high energy photon. There are different, uh, these are the f different uh, uh, radio tracers we have from rubidium to ammonium to uh, O15 water and fluoridopaz. You know, most labs uh, are using either rubidium and ammonium, and we're using rubidium. And what's important to know with rubidium, of course, is its half-life is very short at 76 seconds. And that's why we're not able to exercise patients, and we really have to have a generator on site where we can administer the drug right away. Um, what is, because of its very high uh, energy photon, uh, you can get, you know, we've heard Dr. Amala's talks of how good image quality um, is with PET imaging. So we discussed a little bit about this already, how, you know, um, it's important that you have flow, a radio tracer uptake in proportion to flow. And why, and, and what's, in, and, in order to get uh, radio tracer uptake, in proportion to flow, you have to have a very high myocardial extraction of the radio tracer. The highest radio extraction is by O15 water, which you'll remember is a PET agent. And what you can notice from this curve is if you look at the technetium-based agents, they actually have the lowest extraction fraction. So, you know, if when it comes to if you want the highest accuracy to detect um, coronary artery disease, obviously agents that mimic flow will give you the best answer. So really, thallium is much better than technetium when it comes to uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the relationship between flow and uptake. Um, the pe other agents, PET agents, are, you know, in between the, uh, the technetium-based agents and thallium. Another thing that's very important to notice is most of the agents have what we call a roll-off phenomenon, where that as the flow increases, there's very little difference in radio tracer uptake. And this can be very important because you can imagine in when you deliver regodinus and you get three to four times increase in flow, that if you have difference in flow between two regions, because of this roll-off phenomenon, you may not get a differential radio tracer deposition. And therefore, you may not get a difference in signal intensity on your relative perfusion images. And that may be one of the reasons why um, uh, we can have um, a, a, a missed, uh, a, a balanced ischemia case, as in this case, where, you know, uh, this patient, what do you call it, um, uh, w uh, you know, on perfusion images, um, uh, it had the homogeneous relative perfusion.
And this is really one advantage where PET affords us is the ability to actually then also not only look at relative perfusion, but also look at quantitative myocardial blood flow. And, um, um, and we've heard a lot of lectures on these, and we'll be talking more about how we use this in the cases we're going to present. And this was a case where it was presented, uh, where it was very useful. You had normal relative perfusion, very abnormal absolute perfusion, which led to the diagnosis of a critical uh, stenosis in the left main. When it comes to um, uh, protocols, it's very important to know that we do patients. There are many different protocols, as you see on the left side of the screen. However, two overriding principles are we want to do patient-centered imaging. We want to really choose the right test for the right patient. And then number two, need to achieve radiation doses as low as reasonable. We are, our goal is to get less than 9 millisieverts in at least 50% of studies per ASNIC recommendations. We use weight dosing protocols, and it's important to have updated software and hardware, which can all help us reduce our radiation exposure. This is kind of the protocol we're using here at HMH. We use uh, a low-dose stress-first spec strategy. And the idea is that a patient will get injected with low-dose, will do stress imaging first. A physician will then review the images. If those images are completely normal, we're done. The rest images really do not add much more. And I will show you prognostic data on my next slide with that. Um, and so this can be a very easy, good, fast strategy to decrease radiation exposure to the patient, to the lab, to increase lab throughput um, as, as well. However, we do recognize that there are patients that may not fit well in this category. If you have patients who are two-day protocols, who are large, uh, or you expect a lot of breast attenuation, then we, these are patients who are a priori going to be sending to the PET lab to be performed rather than using SPECT imaging. Or if we have a patient with a prior myocardial infarction, maybe recent caffeine use, a uh, small amount of caffeine use, you know, these are patients where we'll flip the protocol and begin with rest imaging first, but still do it in one day and try to get the stress done uh, and interpret it on the same day. Um, um, one th important to note is we have added to our protocol calcium scoring on the SPECT images in order to get an anatomical bur disease burden, because as you know, anatomical disease burden is what predicts long-term risk. This is data showing you, done by Dr. Chang and others, showing you that if you have a normal stress-only study, it, is, it has equal um, prognostic value to a rest stress study without all the radiation and with a much faster throughput. When it comes to PET protocols, Dr. Amala has taught us this extensively, and um, I've used his slide here. Uh, for reference, an important point to note is, you know, with um, uh, PET, you are starting with rest first, then performing the stet, uh, stress. It's a very fast exam. You're done in 25 minutes, and you get the bonus of a calcium score at the end. So just, again, bonuses of PET are the ability to perform coronary calcification and myocardial blood flow, which we're going to hear a lot about um, in the upcoming cases. So this is kind of an example case that, you, you know, we'll see in the lab every day. You know, it's important to know how to interpret this. Hopefully these are points that we will hit as we go on with our discussion. We'll have to review raw images. We'll look at qualitatively what we l see, how, what perfusion looks like. We may do quantitation on it, semi-quantitation on it. You know, we'll look at our functional data, and then we'll tie everything to that together, the clinical data, stress EKG, uh, and uh, any hemodynamics to create an in interpretation. Uh, there are important risk features of stress in PET that you, we need to know to identify physicians for that put them uh, patients at high risk. And these are, of course, anybody with low ejection fractions, large ischemic areas greater than 10 percent, um, significant ST segment changes on EKG, um, post-stress stunning, or pa uh, transient ischemic dilation, patients who have in multiple coronary territories ischemic defects.
Uh, a very important point, uh, a conversation in the talk is diagnostic accuracy of these tests. If you look at pharmacological and exercise tests with SPECT, this is data from the literature that shows very robust sensitivity for detecting coronary, and, uh, cor uh, coronary disease greater than 50% by left heart catheterization. Specificity is a little bit lower, but all labs now are employing strategies to improve specificity, including the use of technetium-based agents, gated SPECT, attenuation correction, and performing prone imaging. When we look at diagnostic accuracy for PET, PET by far and away has the highest diagnostic accuracy. This is one study here, um, um, you know, looking at the three major tests, and you can see PET had the best uh, AUC. Another study where uh, uh, the, the same patient was imaged with PET, SPECT, and CTA, again, the AUC for PET uh, was the most robust. When it comes to prognosis, many uh, very large, robust data has shown us that if a patient has a normal myocardial perfusion exam, the risk is very low at 0.6%, whereas as your study is abnormal, your risk is sevenfold higher. But it's important to know that risk is, con uh, is con uh, contextual. Uh, the greater the risk your patient has, yes, your risk will be higher than the 0 to 6% that's quoted. So for example, if your patient cannot exercise, just the fact that they need a pharmacological stress test puts them at higher risk than somebody who can exercise. Other risk groups where the risk may be greater than 1% include those patients with known CAD, uh, diabetics, chronic kidney disease, and the elderly. This is a study just showing you how, um, based on the presence of your abnormality on your SPECT images, you know, your, your risk for cardiac death or and myocardial infarction proportionately increases. This is a study showing you also very nicely that this is, the perfusion images gives you data beyond the Duke treadmill score. So even if you may have a, loop, uh, a, a, nor, a normal Duke treadmill score or lower uh, Duke treadmill score, your perfusion abnormalities will then predict your risk. This is a very nice study that looked at the relationship between perfusion abnormalities and then also e ejection fraction. And you can see here, as your perfusion abnormalities increases, your risk increases. As your ejection fraction decreases, your risk increases. Finally, we also use myocardial perfusion imaging every day to help us decide who would benefit from interventional therapies. And these are retrospective data, uh, um, which has shown us that, you know, generally a cutoff, an ischemic cutoff of about 10% is uh, what in general may be help uh, identify a patient that could benefit from uh, revascularization. When it comes to uh, a cardiac PET, PET has very similar data. This is a large cohort of patients very nicely showing you that if you have a normal perfusion, your risk is very low, whereas as your perfusion abnormality increases, your risk proportionately increases for uh, a cardiac events. When we try to use the interplay between perfusion abnormalities and coronary blood flow, this is data from our own Dr. Almullah and others that very nicely show us that as your perfusion abnormality increases, your risk increases. Also, if you add to that what your coronary flow reserve is, you can also see further stratification. So um, uh, coronary blood flow can be a very powerful prognostic independent predictor. You can see here patients who have normal perfusion, but as they get worsening of their coronary blood flow, these patients are increased risk for cardiac death or myocardial infarction. So. Um, I hope that's given us good insight into basics, and uh, in the next few three cases that Dr. Pornazi will share with us, we'll apply some of these principles. Thank you, Faisal. That was uh, really uh, a very broad overview of nuclear cardiology and how it is used in everyday clinical practice. I just want to emphasize a few points that uh, Dr. Nabi kind of um, uh, illustrated so it's like in terms of ex uh, stress modality obviously exercise is still the preferred method especially if you are doing um, spect imaging with pet that's a limitation but we are still encouraging exercise with spect as much as we can it has a lot of uh, clinical information
And Dr. Nabi also showed very important uh, information about the role of caffeine. So if you're going to use vasodilator stress, it's very important to avoid false negative studies by making sure that your patient is not using uh, uh, making sure that your patient is not you has not used caffeine and finally one uh, point and if I put in my other hat as the president-elect of American Society of Nuclear Cardiology we are currently discouraging the use of thallium unless we are really in like there is no other option so thallium is really a very remote uh, uh, probability of using it, uh, we want to utilize th uh, technetium and uh, PET imaging to limit the radiation exposure for our patients. So these are very important points that Dr. Nabi has mentioned and very important to see how this plays in real uh, life. Uh, we're going to move on uh, in a few seconds to um, uh, some case presentations by Dr. Uh, Payam Pornazari from our uh, fellowship who will share a few cases. But before that, we have one question, Dr. Nabi, about the basis of the 85% maximum target heart rate and how do we access exercise and inotropic uh, uh, stress testing based on this target? Yes, yeah, so... Um <clears throat> So I, to be honest with you, I'm not 100% aware, you know, of so the data. I, I, maybe I can interject here. I mean, it's not specifically that there's a magic thing that happens at 85% where 84 is bad and 86 is great. So these are, this is a continuum of risk and continuum of probability to detect ischemia there have been some studies late in the 70s where it looked at these in animal models and using the vitamin and see that you get the best uh, probability in terms of sensitivity and specificity for detecting decrease in myocardial blood flow at this level and this is where we kind of looked at this target but again for clinicians in everyday life, I would always remind everyone that there is nothing magic about the 85, 90% if the patient is on the treadmill and the patient, it's not, you should not stop uh, the stress test because the patient reached the 85%. It is a symptom limited. So if the patient reached 100, let them go to 100. If the patient can exercise longer, we want them to exercise as much as they can so we get all the information that we uh, gather. So 100% is better than 85% and better than 90% and there's nothing magic about the cutoff. It's more of a an easier way to assess adequacy and sensitive balance sensitivity and specificity. Okay, so with this, I'm, uh, before I again uh, have the microphone to Dr. Uh, Payam, I want to remind everyone that we would like this to be more interactive. So please go to polyv.com, enter the bakey, and please send us some questions and your thoughts about like what's going on with these cases. Or text uh, the bakey to 37607 and text in your message. Payam, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Amala, um, and thank you, Dr. Navi, for a great talk. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today, um, I will be discussing three cases, uh, focusing mostly on PET imaging, uh, and the cases are in three different scenarios. So hopefully you find them uh, useful. So our first case is a 63-year-old female that presented with chest pain. Her past medical history was significant for dyslipidemia. Uh, and her social history was um, unremarkable. She's been a lifelong non-smoker, very active, running uh, pretty much through the, uh, her whole life. Um, she was referred for a cardiac PET imaging. This was her baseline uh, ECG, which shows sinus bradycardia with no significant abnormality. And with administration of uh, recadenesin, uh, she had proper heart rate response, but her ECG became, uh, became kind of scary. Uh, she had uh, frequent PVCs um, and um, uh, she remained asymptomatic through the study though. 
This is uh, her, uh, her um, cardiac PET um, imaging. Um, uh, in the, uh, you can see the rest imaging and the stress imaging. Um, you can see a clear perfusion abnormality in uh, the basal uh, to the distal uh, anterolateral and infralateral segments um, uh, corresponding to a circumflex uh, slash obtuse marginal territory. Uh, these are the gated images uh, for this study. Uh, there is clear hypokinesis and wall motion abnormality that was noted in the uh, hyperperfuse segment. And this is her calcium score. Her calcium score was uh, very mild at 24. That 24, uh, the main uh, calcium score was actually detected in uh, the LAD and RCA with a calcium score of zero in the circumflex territory. Dr. Navi um, um, mentioned the myocardial blood flow. So we do a, a, a detailed assessment of the uh, myocardial blood flow in all these cases. And in this case, um, there was a perfusion defect as uh, it does il uh, illustrate it in the right uh, circle in the, um, in the lateral segment. Um, and these are the, the numbers for uh, myocardial blood flow. You can see that there is a rest uh, myocardial blood flow, which is normal. Our uh, normal um, um, uh, myocardial blood flow range is between 0.7 to 1.2. Uh, and in this scenario, although the circumflex had a slightly lower uh, myocardial blood flow at rest, um, uh, it did not show a significant augmentation um, uh, with uh, a stress as well. Uh, you can see that the flow reserve. Um, shall I just? I'm just going to quickly. So meanwhile, uh, what do you think, Dr. Nabi? I mean, we have a patient who has a perfusion defect in the lateral wall. Uh, her ejection fraction is not bad. Her calcium score is not uh, that abnormal. Uh, in fact, one vessel that we are concerned about, there are no calcifications detected. And the biggest question now, is this real? Is this an artifact? What quality assurances we have to ensure before calling a defect there? Yeah, so that, that's an interesting case, Moaz. Um, well, we know we can have uh, non-calcified plaque, so you may not see calcium in an artery, but that doesn't necessarily absolutely rule out a stenosis. If we look at the flows, there was good flow augmentation in the circumflex. So, you know, uh, the perfusion images were very convincing. You know, it, look, it definitely looks like a real perfusion abnormality with stunning. In this particular case, I would, so I would conclude from this, from all the variables that I would expect to see a lesion in the left circumflex. I think you will not find a lesion in the LAD and the RCA. And in general, because the flow reserve is um, almost three and greater here in this particular case, that the prognosis for this patient should be very, very good. So um, this may be a good patient to try your best with medical therapy, uh, and even if you see a significant lesion on the okay. angiogram. Yeah, so the, the, all these are good points. So uh, the atherosclerosis burden in this patient is not very high although there is a good size perfusion defect. I mean, she may or may not be, quote unquote, an ischemia candidate because her symptoms are relatively new and uh, you have to try medical therapy to ensure that her symptoms uh, become stable. Uh, the other question here, from a technical standpoint, because in PET it is always obligatory to use PET-CT, so we want to make sure that the registration is fine. So whenever you take two modalities, nuclear and CT, and superimpose the images on top of each other, you want to make sure that the patient didn't move in between. That applies to spec, that applies to PET. But in PET, it is not an option. Every PET is done as PET CT or PET attenuation correction. And you have to make sure that your images are well registered. And that's why in this case, the first step, always make sure we look at fusion images and ensure that we have good registration and this is not a misregistration.
But as Dr. Nabi, once we did our quality part and ensured everything, if you look at the flows, the overall, the, the number in the uh, right lower corner, uh, the overall flow is uh, 3.37 and there's a lot of data to show that if your global myocardial blood flow reserve is uh, normal, this carries a lot of information and prognostic value. But if you go now to the peak flow, now you can see that the circumflex is probably the least has the least augmentation although it's even still more than two but the augmentation is from 0.6 to one point almost 1.4 it is less than the other vessels and that's why we see the uh, perfusion defect in the lateral wall and that's why we are we're seeing this relative perfusion so i think this case clearly illustrates the value of flow and helping you identify single vessel disease and also identifying a patient with good prognosis uh, thank you dr amala yeah exactly and um what do you think of the regional flow that it didn't reach, um, uh, the peak myocardial blood flow that didn't reach uh, two in the circumflex? Is that? Yeah, uh, so I mean, as we were saying, I mean, it looks like there is a lesion in the circumflex, and even though we don't see calcification there, but it is very convincing that this is a circumflex territory. It's a lateral wall. I mean, each patient is different. This might be a large ramus, or if it is lateral wall, sometimes could be supplied by different vessels from different patients. But irrespective, in the lateral wall, there's a perfusion defect, and the flow did not uh, augment. It augmented, but it did not augment as much as it augmented in other vessels. And this is going back to the point that Dr. Nabi was mentioning. So whenever you have a stenosis, flow is relatively normal at rest. But in the, when you give vasodilator, the vasodilator agent, the flow increases on in all territories, even among those who have lesions, unless you have a steel phenomena. But the increase in the vessel in the area that's supplied by a stenotic vessel is less than the increase in other vessels without obstructive disease, and that's exactly what we see here, and that's why what we why you see a relative perfusion defect. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this patient um, uh, underwent a coronary angiogram, um, and the coronary angiogram clearly demonstrated a. 99% lesion in the first obtuse marginal um, with some collateral flow uh, that was getting coming from uh, the LAD. There was a, a distal lesion also in uh, the RCA um, and uh, a patient underwent uh, uh, IWIS guided PCI um, and uh, OM lesion uh, got stented. There were some uh, complications initially when uh, they were trying to uh, do the wire in the RCA and uh, they had to uh, also uh, do a PCI to the RCA as well in this case. Okay. Uh, so any, so any comments? Yeah, yeah, so this is clearly a case where it was clearly identified that the other vessels did not have much stenosis. I think uh, this is the added value of flow here. Although the SPECT imaging, uh, sorry, the uh, summed images were very uh, diagnostic in this case and uh, can guide you that there is only single vessel uh, disease in this point. Yeah. So any questions from our colleagues at the Houston Methodist who uh, are on Zoom? If you have any question or comment, you can unmute and uh, ask your question. Dr. Nabi, there was a question about SPECT imaging. So after you're done with your SPECT and you injected your radio tracer, can the patient have caffeine or <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I, we would, I think we would love for them to get imaged and then have their caffeine. But, you know, the idea is these radio tracers, at least with technetium-based tracers, get locked in to the myocardium at the time of peak hyperemia. So it gets deposited in flow and it stays there. And that's why we're able to image them 45 minutes later. So, um, you know, obviously if you're doing rest imaging, you don't want to give them caffeine if they're on the way to, to get imaged. If they're done with their, if you're doing stress as your second part of your test, then maybe you can, but I mean, 
you know, I, I hope it's not such an urgency that they need to drink their caffeine right away. If it's stress-only imaging, you know, you, they'll have to wait because you, we have to look at these images uh, before we can decide whether the patient will need rest or not. Okay. okay. All right. So if there are no other questions, and again, I remind everyone to send your questions on polyv.com. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Payam, to the second case. Okay. So we're going to go to another extreme of, our, uh, of the patients that we see. So this is a 67-year-old male that presented with uh, a chief complaint of shortness of breath. His past medical history is uh, uh, noticeable for peripheral vascular disease. He had uh, prior uh, surgical intervention for aorta bifemoral bypass uh, and aortic aneurysm repair, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and uh, he's been a former smoker with a 40-pack year smoking history. Uh, when he presented, his uh, uh, transthoracic echocardiogram showed normal bi biventricular size and function uh, with normal wall motion. This is his uh, baseline ECG. His baseline ECG remained relatively unchanged uh, throughout the uh, stress when he... Uh, so even before you move, I mean, we are sure this patient had atherosclerosis. Atherosclerotic I mean, disease, exactly. It's already been documented in one vascular bed and probably present in the coronaries to start with. Now the point is, are these symptoms related to atherosclerosis exactly, yeah. or... So it's very important to look for these. Exactly, yeah. Um, patient uh, underwent an anatomical testing with a coronary CT angiography. And the coronary CT angiography, as Dr. Amala clearly mentioned, showed extensive uh, coronary artery calcification in all uh, major epicardial arteries. Um, his coronary calcium, as we get to it later, uh, it was more than 2,000. So what do you think, Dr. Nabi? I mean, how much, like, are you comfortable with coronary CT angiography in patients with the extensive calcifications? Yeah, this is, this is a good point, and I'm uh, really happy, Payam, you brought this up. Um, you know, which chest to choose first, uh, I think, it, what is what we're kind of getting at. You know, should, you, should, that, should the physician have gone with a perfusion image first, or as the le re most recent guidelines have recently started, you know, emphasizing the role of CT. And this is a good example. You know, this was a patient who had, as you guys discussed, a very high pretest probability with known vascular disease. This was a patient, you know, where you can more than likely expect them to have involvement of the coronary exactly. circulation. Yeah. Now, you don't know the extent of coronary calcification, but you can see here this patient had a CT had tremendous amounts of calcium, had tremendous amounts of blooming artifact, which can really impair your ability to see the, uh, uh, the, the lumen of the artery and therefore determine stenosis severity. Exactly. So in this case, you know, a lot of labs don't necessarily have FFR. Uh, there's, you know, a lot to be learned with FFR and severe calcification, CTFFR. So, you know, um, this is a good example where you, you started off with one test and needed to layer tests in order to get your answer. Exactly, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nabi. Yeah, so this patient um, um, came to our lab for a cardiac PET. Um, and his, again, um, you can see the rest imaging. And he had a relatively uh, normal perfusion at, um, at baseline, although there is uh, some uh, um, a minor perfusion uh, defect in the uh, basal uh, inferior wall. And uh, this uh, uh, perfusion defect clearly becomes significant uh, with a stress imaging with a large perfusion defect uh, in uh, the basal to uh, distal uh, inferior wall corresponding to an RCA uh, territory at this, uh, at this point. Uh, this was his uh, um, uh, flow assessment. Uh, the flow assessment again confirmed that, that there is a perfusion defect in the uh, inferior segments. Um, and uh, these are uh, the flow numbers uh, um, uh, corresponding uh, to, uh, to a, an RCA territory. Again, a relatively normal resting flow with uh, no uh, augmentation um, uh, uh, in the RCA territory compared to the other vascular beds, uh, 
However, if you compare uh, this case to the prior case, you can see that the flow reserve in this case remained below uh, 2, which is the cutoff that we would like to use. And also the hyperemic flow, uh, then the peak flow, also remained below 2, which is, uh, uh, yeah. which is a, uh, a concern. So Dr. Amala, can you? Yeah, so I mean, going back, I mean, we know this patient has atherosclerosis. We knew that from his history, and the CT kind of confirmed these findings. But again, the perfusion defect uh, would be with that extensive atherosclerosis. So if I'm doing uh, SPECT imaging, I may be a little bit concerned that I may be underestimating the perfusion defect because he has also a ton of calcium in LAD and the left circumflex, but we don't know if there are hemodynamically significant lesions in these mm -hmm. vessels. Uh, now, this is where flow is going to become a very uh, add, it adds a lot of information here, and it plays both diagnostic and prognostic value. So let's start with his prognostic value. Dr. Uh, Pornazari just mentioned, I mean, his flow reserve is below 2. I mean, 1.8 is not that bad, but still, it's like for a relatively younger patient, that's not what we would like it to be. So uh, 1.8 is kind of the cutoff that has been used in some studies. So he's like more on the lower, uh, no, low normal to mildly reduce myocardial blood flow. That in itself carries a little bit of a higher risk. But what's interesting is that even though with all these calcifications, his resting flow is normal, and his peak flow kind of augmented of overall, but it augmented more so in the LAD and LCX, and much less in the RCA. And this kind of hints you that probably most of the problem is in the RCA, and this is what we saw in the summed images. So from a diagnostic standpoint, I think that most of his disease and the LAD and left circumflex is more non-obstructive disease, and most of it, and the obstructive disease is going to be more limited to the right coronary artery. So this case kind of help shows how uh, PET myocardial perfusion imaging with flow assessment kind of guide you to differentiate multivessel disease from single vessel disease in a patient with high atherosclerotic burden. And if I remember correctly, this patient had very high calcium score yeah. above uh, like 3,000 or so. Uh, let me show you. His or close yeah. to 3,000. Yeah, close, his calcium score was 2749. Yeah, so close to 3,000 in these settings, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of like adding the risk of, um, we, we know the atherosclerotic burden is the, like is the most potent predictor for this patient, but uh, in terms of adding the predictor of like uh, peak myocardial blood flow yeah. to his case. Uh, so this is a very case? important aspect. I mean, I think we need to emphasize this, that what will determine the long-term outcome of these patients is the atherosclerotic burden. Yes, there is a problem, focal problem in the RCA, most likely we will see that later. But the long term, this guy has a lot of atherosclerotic burden. And the long term prognosis of these patients is going to be determined by their atherosclerotic burden. Mm -hmm. Perfusion is going to help you to identify the cause of the symptoms and the amount of ischemia. And the amount of ischemia is going to be, usually goes hand in hand with atherosclerotic burden, but it's not one to one ratio. And now we have also the added impact of flow. And recently we published a paper on nearly 4,000 patients who had PET and atherosclerosis burden assessment by calcium score. And both values add to each other. So if you look at calcium score, if you look from the information you gain from calcium score, you add more information by adding the flow reserve in these patients from a prognostic standpoint. And here you saw how it added diagnostic information because now, even though I know that there is a lot of atherosclerosis in all vessels, now I can pinpoint the vessel that has the uh, reduced perfusion and probably a stenotic lesion in it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
So this, uh, this patient also underwent a uh, cardiac cath. Um, the left side uh, system uh, did not show any significant obstructive disease. Um, however, the right coronary artery uh, had a high-grade uh, stenotic lesion in the proximal RCA. Uh, and patient underwent a, um, uh, had an unsuccessful PCI um, uh, initially and then came back and uh, got a PCI with atherectomy uh, to the proximal RCA. So very important to show the added value of perfusion imaging in general among patients with high calcium score but not just the sump perfusion imaging, but also the quantitative, the absolute assessment of these patients, because there are often many cases that have high calcium score and might have more than just one vessel. And this is where you need quantitation to be able to differentiate single from multivessel disease. Exactly, thank you. Uh, as uh, oh. Dr. Amala All mentioned. Right, so can we quickly just move on to the last case so yeah. we can stay on time? Okay, so our last case, we're gonna go uh, continue the spectrum, uh, go to uh, the next stage. Uh, so this is a 46 year old male uh, that presented with uh, CCSC class two to three angina. His past medical history was noticeable for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he had multivessel disease uh, post cabbage uh, with Lima to LAD, vein to OM, and vein to RCA uh, as documented. Uh, this was, uh, he was referred for a cardiac PET. Uh, this was his baseline uh, ECG, uh, which was uh, relatively um, uh, unremarkable, and that uh, remained um, unchanged with uh, our uh, uh, regadenosine infusion or injection. This is his baseline uh, imaging that showed uh, a normal uh, rest and uh, uh, stress uh, perfusion imaging and uh, normal uh, wall motion in all territories uh, during rest and uh, stress with a uh, good augmentation of his EF from 68% to 74%, more than 5% that we would like to see with uh, regadenosine injection. Uh, this was uh, his uh, myocardial uh, blood flow quant uh, quantitation uh, and uh, all mm. the numbers in this setting uh, was uh, uh, pretty much normal with normal resting blood flow, normal peak myocardial blood flow, more than two, and a very good uh, myocardial flow reserve. So this is one situation where the blood flow has been questioned in terms of its added value among patients with post-bypass surgery because these patients may have collateral, so the blood flow is not only dependent on just a vasodilatory effect on the coronary arteries, but now you have the grafts, you have collaterals, you have uh, severe calcifications, and it may not be easy to kind of outline. But there are many cases where we see post-bypass who have also good, color, good flow, and we hope that this is an area which is currently being studied. We hope that these patients will have good outcomes and good prognostic value with myocardial blood flow. However, the reverse may not always be true. So if you have decreased flow, but your perfusion is normal, that doesn't always mean that the grafts have been, have been uh, occluded, but it may be just native vessel disease and microvamp circulatory or like distal to the grafts that these patients have kind of diffuse disease. So uh, I still feel that a normal flow in these patients is more reassuring. However, the reverse doesn't always mean that it is alarming. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this patient also had a coronary angiogram, um, uh, was done as part of his workup, which showed uh, uh, normal um, and patent grafts uh, to, uh, to the LAD and circumflex. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, there was no comment on the RCA graft in, in this setting. Which uh, brings us uh, to uh, the point that um, PET is a great uh, assessment uh, uh, and a tool for assessment in these patients uh, post revascularization, as Dr. Amala Kuyeri mentioned. All right, so I think these are three nice cases to show how we use PET and and like nuclear imaging in uh, everyday clinical case, I think we're at the top of the hour and uh, 
We thank you for attending and uh, thanks for uh, sending your questions and uh, thanks to my co-speakers, Dr. Nabi and Dr. Parmazali for great presentations.